one man or one woman that can accomplish the work that God wants to do. It always takes a group of committed believers building to accomplish God's work. It's just that simple. Every single person here has a part to play in what God is doing here. And this week, we get to see some exciting times. I mean, the building project now is in full swing. The resources have arrived. The workers are there. They have their assignments. They've been given clear directions, and everyone is getting to work, and things are finally getting done. Really exciting, right? But did you know not everyone's excited when God's people builds God's kingdom God's way? There was a group of people that viewed what was going on in Jerusalem as a threat to their power, to their wealth, and their authority. Christian, I think we need to understand, like we just need to accept the fact that there are people out there that would rather things stay broken than for God's people to fix them so that God would receive the glory. They just don't want that to happen. There are people that are going to actively misunderstand what we're doing. They're going to misrepresent what we're doing. And we just have to accept that now. You know, once you decide that you're going to build your life your marriage, your family, this church, your community for Christ, it will not be smooth sailing from there. I think sometimes we go into this with rose-colored glasses. I think it's all going to be easy now that we want to do things God's way. But I want to make one thing exceedingly clear this morning. Now, don't miss this. I don't want you to go home and not remember this. Heaven's opportunities will always face hell's opposition. And let me say that again. Heaven's opportunities will always face hell's opposition. There is someone by the name of Satan who does not like that 12 people got baptized last week. And he's scheming and he's plotting. You know, I love what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon said, God only had one son without sin, but he's never had a son or a daughter who didn't face a trial. So if you're trying to build your life, your marriage, your family, this church for Christ, let's understand that we're going to face opposition. And as we read this passage this morning, we're going to see that Satan's game plan hasn't changed much in 2,000 years. See, when you say, I'm building for Christ, you're going to face public ridicule. You're going to face personal attacks. The question is, will we stand our ground or will we fold? So let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you now grateful for what you've already done, for what you've already taught us, what the truths you've spoken into our hearts. So now, Lord, I pray that you would calm my nerves that you would take these words and by your spirit make them come alive. That we would see your truth. That our hearts would be softened. That our ears and our eyes would have the ability to hear and see what you want from us. Father, we love you and we praise you. Speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said... Amen. Everyone, please open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, there's one in the pew in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, that is your Bible. Please enjoy that. The words will also be on the screen. So Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. He mocked the Jews before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria and said, what are these pathetic Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? 
Will they offer sacrifices? Will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mounds of rubble? Then Tobiah the Ammonite who was beside him said, Indeed, even if a fox climbed up what they are building, he would break down the stone wall. Point one this morning is when you rebuild things God's way, you should expect public ridicule. See, when you start living your life the way God has designed it, you will be made fun of. You will be mocked. People just don't understand it. People start to fear it. And what people don't understand and what people fear makes them angry. Here we have a building project that is not going to hurt Sanballat or Tobiah or any of his crew, but they are terrified and they are furious. They just want it to stop now. Now I've experienced this. I remember when God delivered me. So years ago, years ago I wasn't preaching God's word. Years ago I was running around on street corners in Brooklyn. And I remember when God just reached down and fixed some things. And when I started telling people God changed my life, I got the sense that they would have rather it stayed broken than for God to get the glory. But have you ever had someone whose marriage is falling apart and then they start doing it God's way and they start going to church and they start applying biblical principles to their lives and their friends who are supposed to care about them and have their best interests at heart start saying, man, it's a, it's a shame that those two became holy rollers. What happened to those two? Young adults, young adults who decide to do things God's way. Hey, we're not going to have sex before marriage. You know what? We're not going to move in together. I don't care what it costs to rent here on Long Island. We're going to build this relationship on God's holy standard. And their friends will make fun of them. And they will mock them. Even the ones that haven't had a good relationship ever. Man, what are you guys doing? You guys are idiots. See, people don't like God's way of doing things. Now, you don't have to be judgmental. You don't have to be the person judging what they're doing. You just have to live your life God's way, and they won't like it. Now, if you don't believe me, go on your social media accounts, right? Go on your social media accounts, and today, just post a loving and kind affirmation of God's design for marriage and family. You're laughing because you got some friends that'll defriend you real quick. You're not condemning anyone. You're just saying, I want to build things God's way. See, that makes people mad because it means you're rejecting their way. You know, man wants to make the rules. And when God's people live God's way, it reveals God's presence. And when God's presence is revealed, our sin is revealed. And all that riles people up. They don't want to be told that they're not doing the right thing. Now, this wasn't the first time this crew tried to step in and stop what God was doing. You can turn a few pages back to Nehemiah chapter 2, the last two verses, 19 and 20. We see this crew at the beginning of the project. It says, When Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and despised us and said, What is this you're doing? What are you, rebelling against the king? I gave them this reply. The God of heaven will grant us success. We, his servants, will start Building, but you have no share, no right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. And I bring that passage to you now because this is when the opposition starts. And what I want you to notice is that it's kind of the same crew behind the scenes flaming the masses. We see it's Sanballat. I'm going to call him Sandy because I can't stand this guy's name. Sandy is giving them this ridiculously hard 
time. And you need to understand there's a principle behind that. Behind every opposition, there is a person or a small group of people who are leading it. Most of the masses will just go along. But there is this crew behind the scenes that are stirring up problems. And what are they doing? They're misrepresenting what God's people are trying to do. He says, what are you guys doing? Oh, man. The accusation here is that you're rebelling against the king. Nothing could have been further from the truth. The king gave them the materials to rebuild. See, but the truth doesn't matter. See, like then, like today, we live by our feelings, not the facts. So God's people are being misrepresented so that people would be upset and their feelings, their emotions would get fanned up. Would get... What do they, who do they think they are? What are they doing? You know where we see this today? In politics. I'm about to make everyone unhappy. Which is my goal as your pastor. <laughs> right? I'm not a political guy, but l let me say this. Here's, here's how we do politics today. Oh, you're for, com you're for compassionate immigration reform? Man, you must be an MS-13 supporter. Oh, you believe in border security? You must be a bigot. Both of those positions are ludicrous. And what they're meant to do is they're meant to get you to act based on your feelings, not the facts. And that's what's happening right here. So if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, there are some people that are going to say, well, they're bigots. They hate gay people. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible tells us that we love our neighbor. It doesn't say what kind of neighbor. It just says, love your neighbor. We're not a bigot because we believe in God's way. But do you see how when you frame an issue, when you misrepresent some things and you get to people's feelings, the facts really don't matter. And that's what's going on here. You know, God's people have had a long history of enduring this kind of thing. I mean, I can tell you as your pastor that when I meet people and they find out I'm a pastor, they automatically assume a whole bunch of things about who I am that are not true. I mean, it's just how it is. Oh, you're, oh. <laughs> All right. Even with the tattoo, you would think this would ease the blow. Not at all. That's why some of you, you guys are laughing, but some of you go to work and you're in the Christian version of the Witness Protection Program. <laughs> what do you do once I go to church? What do you do once I go to church? Well, you don't want to tell anybody you belong to Jesus because you don't want to be criticized. And here's the thing, just like we see here, critics never run alone. Critics are cowards. Critics only, always, always, always run with the crowd. And we don't want to face that. So we'd rather just enter the Christian Witness Protection Program and just not speak our faith. And I'm reading this scene, I'm reading this, and it's so real, because this scene could take place in any schoolyard or in any workplace in our country today. I mean, this is real bully stuff. But this is a schoolyard bully stuff. We got the, the powerful and the strong, and they're getting together, and you probably got, you know, I picture Sandy as kind of like the biggest guy in the group. You know, and he's the mouthpiece. Whether he's got the most money or the most power or he's just physically huge, whatever it is, he feels comfortable enough to lead the charge. And then at the end of the passage, we see Toby. I call him little Toby. Right? Because I read this, and I, this, is, this, is, this, is not, this is not thus saith the Lord. Okay? I read this, and I see Sanballat running his mouth, and then I see little Toby step up and go, yeah, what he said. <laughs> Even a fox will knock it down Getting behind him But this is how it goes See the crowd that was with Sandy They represented All of the major power centers Surrounding Jerusalem Now for us 
I would say, if you want to bring this fast forward to our time, what we're seeing is we're seeing a group of the movers and the shakers, the Hollywood elite, the media, the wealthy, the intellectual elite, the politicians, and we have this group that is getting before them and then creating this narrative. Right? They want them all to see God's people in a negative light. They want to publicly shame the people of God. So anyone who's thinking about joining them would just step away. So they want to portray them as backward, as uneducated, as superstitious, as superstitious, as hateful. I didn't get it right the second time either. That's all right. <laughs> Someone laughed over there. God be with you. So they want to shape and form public opinion so that it's negative overwhelmingly against God's people so they live a life of shameful embarrassment and hide. You think maybe we're facing that today a little bit? Have you watched the news? Have you listened to some of our favorite celebrities expound on how they feel about Christians? And don't underestimate this. The power of public shaming and embarrassment can be devastating. You know, I don't think I'm saying anything earth-shattering when I tell you that most of us want to belong. Most of us want to be thought well of. And Satan uses that against us. I mean, look, Sandy says, listen, look at them. They're pathetic. And when he says that word, and you bring it back to the original language, there's a lot of connotation there. He's saying, they are weak. They are small. They are insignificant. Remember, not all the Jews went back. Not all of God's people always get on task. Some stay in the sideline. And they were small in number. And the ones that went back weren't number one draft picks. They weren't the engineers. They weren't the contractors. They were goldsmiths and perfume makers and shepherds and guys that had no business in building a wall or gates or anything of that magnitude. And he's saying, look, look at these guys. They're small in number. They don't have the resources. They don't have the skills. They are pathetic. Don't join their team because they are destined to lose. You know who else was destined to lose? David, when he faced Goliath. And man, did the Philistine army have a, a good laugh. Didn't Goliath, oh, you're going to bring out a dog next? Look at this. <laughs> That's God's best? All right. I think he stopped laughing when David cut his head off. I think it's fair to say, right? Doesn't say it, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> or how about the Roman army? The Roman army loved to mock and publicly shame and ridicule the early church. Oh, they had a field day arresting Christians, torturing Christians, publicly shaming Christians. But when was the last time you saw a Roman centurion? Yet here we are. See, it's never about the size or the amount of resources. It's always about God. <laughs> and God can't be beat. And we sang about it. He is the great I am. There is no other. And then he tries to make fun of their faith. When he says, will they offer sacrifices, what he's saying is, what are they going to do? Pray the wall into existence? Look at these silly people getting on their knees and praying and sacrificing to God, hoping he'll move. That's not going to do a thing. He said, look at this. There's broken wood. There's burned. Things are burned to the ground. It's not capable of being restored, and certainly not by prayer. But yet, it was being restored. <laughs> yet, the work was getting done. I said it earlier, things that are impossible by man's standards are not impossible by God's. So, so let, let's say this. There isn't a life, a marriage, a family, a community, or a country that is so broken that God can't rebuild it. There isn't a country, our country, that can't be rebuilt when God's people get on God's mission. 
I mean, we, we, we get so down about this. But listen, yes, we are weak. But God is strong. Yes, we are small. But God is big. In the end, it's not about us. So don't carry that weight. We were designed to carry that weight. Yes, some of us are a mess. And we're surrounded by an even bigger mess. But we serve a God who's going to use our mess to paint his masterpiece. I mean, that's assured. Do you believe it? Have you believed God for that? Whenever heaven presents an opportunity, hell provides opposition. Just expect that you will be publicly ridiculed. Expect that people will mock you. You know, they mocked Jesus as he hung on the cross. They said he saved others, and he can't even save himself. I think they got that wrong. Church, Jesus didn't respond. Nehemiah doesn't respond. There isn't a public relations battle that ensues here. You don't see the next verse, and then Nehemiah stood up and debated Sambalot. So so let's bring that to today. So when you're on your Facebook, or your Twitter, or your Snapchat, or your Instagram, or whatever it is you do, and someone mocks and ridicules you for believing in Jesus, or for building your life God's way, don't retaliate. Don't retaliate. Give it to God, and keep on moving. That is not what we... We're not called to win arguments. We're called to win souls. There is a difference. Next it says in verse 7, When Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ammonites, and Ashdodites heard that the repair to the walls of Jerusalem was progressing and that the gaps were being closed, they became furious. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw it into confusion. So we prayed to our God and stationed a guard because of them day and night. See, when you rebuild broken things God's way, and public ridicule doesn't work, personal attacks will then begin. See, it goes from general to personal real quick. The attacks get worse. They don't get better. So if someone can't embarrass you, into stopping doing what you're doing. They'll try to intimidate you into stopping doing what you're doing. They're going to discourage you by any means necessary. I mean, I remember when I was in my doctoral program, and I referenced this one professor who I really should start praying for, and she just did not like Christians. It was blatant. It was not good. And I looked for every opportunity to talk about Jesus. You know, I was doing my dissertation on servant leadership. Jesus is the perfect model of that. And she would make comments in class publicly, kind of like what Sandy was doing. You know, those those Christians with their backward ways, holding on to their Bibles and their guns and their superstitions and this and those Christians, and I wouldn't take the bait. And everyone would look to me in class. What is he going to say? And I would just sit... And then there was a day when someone said to me, hey, listen, why, why don't you defend yourself? And I said, you know, they did this to Jesus too. And he just loved and loved and loved. And I started sharing the gospel. And this woman went from general statements to, hey, you know, I'm on your dissertation committee, right? You know, you're going to have to defend this in front of me, right? I mean, when it, when it got to the point that I was not going to stop, she let me know that this can get personal real quick. And some of you are in that situation. Some of you are at your jobs. Where your boss has kind of generally made fun of people of faith. But you have not backed off and you have not blown your testimony and they're getting frustrated. So now the personal attacks come. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? It's going to get worse. See, the gospel makes powerful enemies. 
The name Jesus Christ elicits a powerful response from people. I mean, think about this. The most powerful people in the history of the world have been trying to destroy the ministry of a poor carpenter who served for three and a half years. And they, the most powerful, rich, wealthy people have been doing this for thousands of years and they're losing the battle. Millions of people are getting saved all around the world. But we have to recognize that there is a battle. We can't keep our heads in the sand. And what I find funny is that if you look at this crew that's attacking God's people, they all had different interests. They weren't all united based on how they lived, what their ultimate agenda was, or what they looked like. They were united in their despise of God. So they overlooked all their other differences and united to stop God's people. And then I look out at modern Christianity. I mean, we'll divide over anything. You would think that with the mission God gave us, it would be easy for us to lock arms and unite to fight. But no, not us. We want to argue about, hey, do you have drums in church? What translation are you reading out of? You believe in the sign gifts? Come on, man. I got to find a reason to walk away from you. I'm trying. Christian, that's got to stop. That got to stop. Satan and his people have no problem uniting against us. It's how we lock arms and unite for the gospel. We are surrounded by spiritual wickedness in high places. Nehemiah and the people of Israel were surrounded. If you look at a map and just take these kingdoms, you'll notice that to the north was Samaria, and that was Sandy. And then Toby was the governor of Ammonites in the east, and Geshem was the Arabs in the south, and the Astrodites were in the west. They literally, geographically, had the Jews surrounded. They were being attacked from every single angle. And when they see that God's people were making progress, and they were about halfway done, it says the wall was halfway, um, halfway to its height, and things were being connected, they said, oh, no, 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 now's the time. And let me tell you why. Think about this in your own lives. Whenever something you're doing is about halfway done, that's probably when you're most likely to quit. It's probably when you're most likely to get discouraged. Right? When you start something new, it's exciting. Right? You're exciting. If, let's think of home improvements. When you buy a house, you're excited. Right? Oh, we're going to paint this. We're going to lay floors down. We're going to do that. And you start, and you're excited. And two weeks later, you look like who did it, ran away, and forgot about it. Right? It's halfway done. Half the living room's done. And you're not so excited about the last half. So you've made some progress. But the end isn't in sight yet. And you're just tired. You know, it's like that in our personal lives. You know, if we have a marriage where the wheels are just, just coming off the bus and we say, listen, we're going to do things God's way. And, you know, we start doing that and we make progress. We make progress. And then all of a sudden, something gets in our way to discourage us. I can't tell you how many times I've seen marriages start to get better. And then all of a sudden, someone gets sick, and they miss a few counseling sessions. And then the kids have a play. And then something else is going on. And next thing you know, they're right back where they started. I mean, think about it like a diet. I mean, let's say you decide to go on a diet. Who here has been on a diet this year? Anybody? So many of you are lying right now in church. <laughs> that is not a true survey. Right? And you say, I'm going to lose some weight. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get healthy. And you, you do it. And you lose like 10 pounds, 15 pounds. And you can start to see that. 10, 15, you're like, hey, hey I'm going to put on my, my skinny jeans. I mean, not me personally. I don't wear skinny jeans. I'm not a millennial. Amen. <laughs> you know what, Ronnie? I'm going to buy you a pair of skinny jeans, buddy. <laughs> but, yeah. 
right? And so you're doing good, and you're excited, and you're going to put on your skinny jeans, and you're going to go out, and then all of a sudden, you get invited to like four birthday parties and three barbecues, <laughs> right? And at first, it seems like no big deal. And by the time you're done, you're like, forget it. You put the jeans away, and you go back to living. Right? And that's kind of where they're at. They've made some progress. They're excited, but they're tired, and there's a lot left to do. And Satan knows, hey, listen, when I have God's people a little tired and a little discouraged, and they have some doubts because they're being mocked, let's turn up the heat. And that's why Paul tells the church in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the full armor of God so that you could stand against the tactics of the devil. These are tactics. He wants to sow doubt in your mind about your ability to do these things. He wants to discourage you from continuing when you make some progress. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. See, there was a legitimate conspiracy going on in Israel, in Jerusalem. They were out to get God's people. There's a legitimate conspiracy going on now. There is a spiritual war, and Satan and his minions are out to get God's people. You're not paranoid if someone's really after you. We just need to be aware of that. Satan has us surrounded. Maybe we're not physically surrounded like Jerusalem was, but we're surrounded by politicians, by the educational elite, by our media, by Hollywood. There's so much pressure on God's people to stop building their lives and their families and their communities and this country God's way. So the question is not, will culture try to seed, so, um, sow seeds of doubt or discourage us? The question is, how do we respond? And we're going to look at two responses real quick as we're starting to wrap up. In Nehemiah. So in verse 10 of chapter 4, in Judah it was said, The strength of the laborer fails, since there, is, since there is so much rubble. We will never be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, They won't know or see anything until we're among them and can kill them and stop the work. When the Jews who lived nearby arrived, they said to us time and again, everywhere you turn, they attack us. See, when we rebuild broken things God's way, we're going to get public ridicule. We're going to get personal attacks. The only real question is how we respond to that. And we see right away that the first response wasn't a good one. The Jews started to doubt what they were doing. They started looking at all the work that laid ahead and none of the work that God had accomplished behind. They allowed the enemy to discourage them instead of allowing God to encourage them. You know, doubt and discouragement are two of Satan's most potent tools. They were starting to really consider quitting. You could tell it by the language here. When the phrase in the original language says, it was said... What that means is that this phrase had entered into popular culture. In other words, this was heard around town. So we have the same thing. I'll give you one. Like we say, when it rains, it... Okay, this is a saying like that. So when you say that, what are you? You're discouraged. Like one more thing went wrong. When it rains, it pours. That was what they were saying here. This is not going well. The whole attitude, the atmosphere was becoming full of discouragement and defeat. And they're like, oh man, everywhere we turn, everything we do, they're getting attacked. This isn't going to go well for us. And what happens when a small group of people start getting discouraged, it's like a disease. You ever hang out with somebody who's discouraged all the time? It's catchy you start becoming discouraged. I mean, think about it. Years before this, they sent, Moses sent 12 men into the promised land to look at the land. 10 came back discouraged. 10 came back and said, man, I don't know if we can do this. 
And as a result of 10 men's discouragement, over 3 million people wandered around in the desert for 40 years. Discouragement is dangerous. You know, back then, what they started looking at was, man, these people are big. They're tough. That's a tough road ahead of us. But they forgot to look behind them and think about the road God had made through the Red Sea. Nehemiah came with all the resources necessary and the king's blessing to rebuild Jerusalem. They had forgotten that. And they were focused on all the opposition. And they were discouraged. And I think that happens to us all the time. Christian, don't forget what God has already done for you. Don't forget the roads he has already paid for you. Don't focus on your circumstances. Focus on the character of God. You know, some of the Jews are so discouraged. There are some translations that actually add the phrase to this, you must return to us. What they're saying is, hey, listen, this was a noble work. It was worth a shot. I give you an A for effort. It's a good thing that you tried to fix your marriage. It's a good thing that you tried to build this church. It's a good thing you tried to restore your family, but you tried and things are getting tough. Can't we just go back to the way things were? That's what they're saying. Don't ever get so scared by the threats of the enemy that you forget the promises of your God. You know, I really don't care what people say, to be honest. I just care what God has already said. I really don't. I could care less what people say about our ability to reach the world for Christ. Okay. All I know is that God told me the gates of hell couldn't even stop us. So I say we charge. So the people were responded, but then God used his man. God used his man to stand up and say this in verse 13. At first it says, So I stationed people behind the lowest sections of the wall at the vulnerable areas. I stationed them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I made an inspection, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord, and fight for your countrymen, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. I love this because it shows that Nehemiah didn't just pick one thing. He did a few things here. First, he deals with the fact there was an immediate threat. There are some areas that were vulnerable. Let's actually do something about that. I mean, I've talked to people. I've counseled many people. And this is when it gets frustrating. Right? This is when it gets frustrating. When something is destroying their lives, whether it be, let's use drugs and alcohol for our first example. And we identify where the areas are that they're vulnerable. Where they tend to drink and get high. And we tell them, you need to station some guards there. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Or someone whose marriage is falling apart because they can't stop watching porn. And they come for counseling. I said, okay. Let's station some guards. Let's put something on your computer. Let's get you a flip phone. When do you normally do it? You know, it's funny. I tell people to get a flip phone. They look at me like I ask them to sacrifice their firstborn child. I grew up with a beeper. It's not that bad. But seriously, when do, you, when do you consume it? Here's when I consume it. Okay. Every night when you're going to consume it, I want you to call this person at this time. I don't want to do that. We have to set guards in the areas where we're most vulnerable. God doesn't expect us just to sit there. And then Nehemiah says, listen, let's do this, but how about this? How about we just remember? How about we just remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord that we serve? He's never broken a promise. He's never lost a battle. He's never prophesied something, and it didn't come to pass. Never, not once. Don't be discouraged by what they're saying. Look at what God's saying. How could the church not be encouraged by the fact that we have been told that the victory is assured? 
How could we not be encouraged that the gates of hell can't stand before us if we finally just get on our armor and charge? Be encouraged. You know what the problem is? When the opposition comes, we just like to quit. I mean, we'll fight for anything else in our lives. But we won't fight for certain things. Look at it this way. If you go to the gym, and all you do is you go to the gym for four hours a day, and you lift a two-pound weight for four hours. It's two pounds. I got bad news for you. Your bicep is not going to grow. But if you go in the gym and lift some heavier weight, progressively, you'll start to grow stronger. Christian, opposition makes us stronger. It gives us spiritual muscles. It's when we grow as believers. It's called growing pains for a reason. Don't doubt God's goodness. Don't be discouraged when you try to rebuild things God's way and you're ridiculed and you're attacked. Remember the great and awe-inspiring God you serve. The great I am has never taken a day off. He's not in the Bahamas today. He's on the throne. He is reigning. He is ruling. You know, we're not the only people to ever get discouraged. There was a man by the name of Martin Luther in the 16th century. He was one of the great reformers of our time. And there was a time in his ministry that he was really discouraged. And he just was depressed. And he was doubting what God had asked him to do. He was discouraged that he could do it. And his wife came in his study. And she was dressed in all black. And he looked up. And he said, who died? And she looked him square in the eye. And she said, God. And he jumped up. I can only picture this guy. He jumped up and said, my God has never, will not, ever die. How dare you say that? And she said, and start acting like it. Man, if we all had a wife like that, I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my own. For you non-Italians, that's an expression of ex Anyway. Listen. Nehemiah tells him, I know it's tough. I know you're halfway through and you're tired. I know that they're making fun of you. I know that they're saying they're going to attack you and there are some consequences. But listen, listen. Let's do what we can to stand guard. But let's remember who we're serving and let's remember who we're fighting for. He says, remember your countrymen. Christian, remember your unsaved spouses and your children and your family members and your friends and your country. Is that worth fighting for? I hope so. No matter what the opposition, let's continue to be determined to rebuild this church, our lives, our communities, and this country God's way. Let's pray. Let's say everyone to bow your heads and just close your eyes for a minute as Jess comes up and the piano starts to, to play. I just have a few quick questions this morning. You know, it's not enough just to hear God's word. We have to act on God's word. It's faith and works that show that we really believe to begin with. So if you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Mike, I have to admit, all of the mocking and the public ridicule and all the pressure from culture that says, I am stupid for believing in a man named Jesus the Son of God, that I am just uneducated. And it's bothering me, and I'm struggling to stand my ground because I have this desire to, to be a part of and to be accepted. If you're here this morning, you're just struggling with the large amount of just ridicule and mocking that you're facing today to be a believer. Just slip your hand up and slip it down. Oh, thank you for your hands. I will pray for you. You're not alone. This is going to keep happening until Jesus comes back. Now, maybe you're here this morning and things have gotten a little bit worse, right? Maybe you're experiencing a personal attack. Maybe it's a family member who every time you show up for a barbecue, they have to seriously give you a hard time. You don't even want to go anymore. 
Maybe it's somebody at your job. Your, bo your boss is just kind of intimating, hey, listen, Christians don't do well here. You might want to keep your mouth shut if you want a promotion. I don't know what the situation is. But if you're here and you're discouraged and someone's attacking you, you say, Pastor Mike, just pray that God would give me the strength to withstand that attack. Just slip your hand up and slip it down. Amen. You know what? I see those hands and I've been there. If you're here this morning and just overall, you've stopped building. You thought that this is never going to work. My marriage is never going to get fixed. My kids are never going to get right. The church can't grow in this day and age. Our country's too far gone. If you would just say, you know, Pastor Mike, I've had a real attitude of despair, and I just need to remember the great God that I serve, that he would encourage me today. Just slip your hand up and slip it down. Oh, thank you for that honesty. And then finally this morning, maybe you're here, and you don't know Jesus. You've enjoyed the music. You've laughed You've learned something, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you how you can do that this morning. You know, there is a place called heaven. There is a place called hell. We are all designed to live eternally. And God wants you to live with him for all of eternity. So I don't think I need to convince you that you're a sinner. We all make mistakes. We all do bad things. But I do want to tell you, that it doesn't matter whether you think you're the worst sinner or the best sinner. One sin is all it takes to break our relationship with God. And if you want that relationship restored this morning, just pray with me. It's not the words, but it's a faith you're placing in Jesus and say, Father God, I am a sinner and I need your grace. And today I'm going to place my faith and my hope in Jesus Christ that you would forgive my sins because of what he did in the cross. And moving forward, Lord, I just want to be your child. If you prayed that prayer with me, no one's looking. But if you did, just slip your hand up and slip it down. Amen. I see that hand. It is not the end of your journey. This is the beginning of your journey. Father, we are grateful that you are the great I am. Father, we tell you that we want you to do what you want to do. Father, we know that you are a God of mighty wonders and that they will go on forever. Father, those aren't just song titles. That is, that is theology, Lord. That is truth. That is beauty. Father, we're grateful that your spirit does fall down on us so we could understand and learn and become holy. We're grateful, Father, Lord, that you stand perfect and holy, always in control, and that even when this world seems out of control, we can rest in who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.